Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the 401 Access Deny podcast. I'm the host of the show, and my name is Joseph Carson, Chief Security Scientist and Advisory Scissor at Delinea. And it's really fantastic to have you listening to today's episode. Um, I'm always really looking for the most amazing, awesome, talented, like fun people in the industry. And today we have a very special guest, uh, somebody I've known for quite a long time now, um, going way back into our shipping days and maritime industry side of things. Um, so welcome to the show, Ken. Uh, Ken, if you want to give our audience a bit of background about what you do, you know, what fun, fun things you get up to and you know, a bit about your background. Sure. Uh, my name's Ken Munro, and I'm part of the team here at Pentest Partners. And one of the things that we're particularly interested in as part of our pen testing is embedded systems, whether that is, I don't know, the navigational system on a ship's bridge or an engine controller on a car or something connected in your home. It's all about embedded systems. So understanding how technology that we hope is making our lives smarter and better actually could lead to some pretty serious security problems. Absolutely. And and the theme of today is it's all about hacking smart or sm- hacking smart devices in reality. Um, one of the things that always get into the question, and this you know goes back to Mako's book and about other things when we talk about IoT and we talk what what makes a, a device smart? What what's the difference? What what we call them smart devices, we call them IoT devices. Um, what really makes them smart? And are they are they really smart? <laughs> is, that, you know, is, that, is that the right term we should be using? I oh, well, I, I like the term connected actually. Uh, we, we use the term smart, but, but of course, you know, smartphones are connected and, and so are laptops. So there's actually been some really interesting um, negotiation and legal wrangling around certain bits of regulation over the last few years about what, what's a smart product. But I think for the purposes of this, we like to think about you know, connected devices for remote access and telemetry, you know, stuff that's now connected like our, our CCTV so we can see what's going mm-hmm. on remotely in our house. We've got remote access, it's connected, it's smart. Maybe, maybe that's the yeah. way to look at it. Yeah, I agree. For me, it's always about connectivity. But the question is, what really makes it smart? And you're absolutely right. It really just means that we can do things a lot more automated. We can do things when we're not present. We can keep an eye on things. We can get alerted when uh, you know an alarm goes off. We can uh, control devices, or maybe you forgot to do something, or maybe you just want something to operate. Like you know, you want to be able to do the laundry when you're away, or you want to be able to you know control the heating system so you you turn it on when when you're getting close to home. Um, so obviously for me, it's, it's really about that connectivity and the ability to do that, you know, in an automated way and much more, let's say, uh, to make our lives better in the end. But what yeah. types of, you know, for these for these devices, what types, what's what's some of the most interesting vulnerabilities that you've seen? Uh, <laughs> you've been doing this for a long time yeah. and I, I've known I've seen your your, your <laughs> sessions quite often. Um, what's some of the most fun ones that you've seen? In, well, yeah, I think there's definitely differences between fun and, and, and scary, isn't there? Yeah. Um, <laughs> We've seen everything over the years. We've, we first started looking at smart stuff, I suppose, 2014, 15. We had just, the industry okay. was just getting going. And I think the term Internet of Things hadn't long been coined at that point. And everybody was trying to get to market really fast because you get first mover advantage. You know, you've got a certain amount of seed funding to burn through. So there was a lot of rushing going on. And as, as part of that rushing, a lot of the cybersecurity control just didn't even get thought about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of the firms that were rushing to market were typically like mobile app developers. So yep. they were used to building something and updating it later, which is easy in a mobile app. <laughs> but actually really difficult in a smart device if you haven't thought about it first. And there's some great stories of crazy devices that just didn't get it right and ended up falling flat on their face. I've got a few of those here with me today. You've got quite a few. I can see I can see yeah. the doll in the background there. <laughs> yeah. Should we do the dolly? <laughs> oh, do the dolly. Let's do the yeah, dolly. She, she, she to me is, is everything that was wrong and right about smart devices. Um, and the story of this lovely little dolly, my friend Kayla, goes on and on. She's still going now, amazingly. Um, for those of you who haven't seen this wonderful dolly, she's called my friend Kayla. And she hit the market in about mid-2015, I think. Um, and she was the first interactive kid dolly. Really good good idea. You might remember Teddy Ruxpin, that is a smart version of him. Gosh, 10 plus years ago. But this is truly interactive. And um, she's quite cool. Um, she's got a, a speaker and a microphone, the Bluetooth connection, and uh, you can talk to the dolly. The microphone listens to you. It then takes the audio and offloads it over Bluetooth onto the smartphone where it turns the audio into text and then can look up what you asked it and then come up with an answer. Um, <laughs> Bluetooth speaker, microphone. Yes, she is essentially a Bluetooth headset. So I, I kid you not, you can genuinely pair it to your phone 
and um, you can actually make phone calls on the dolly if you wish. She gives you some very weird looks, but anyway. <laughs> so, what was wrong with her? Well, the Bluetooth connection. So when you pair your smartphone with your car, you're asked to compare two numbers. Right? It's called numeric comparison. It's a, it's a component of Blee, Bluetooth mm -hmm. Low Energy. She, however, uses uh, Bluetooth Classic, B-T-E-D-R. And unlike your car, she's got no PIN. And what that means, because there's no PIN, there's basically no authentication or authorization of any of your requests to the Dolly, which means that anyone within Bluetooth range can connect to her. And of course, that's your phone connecting to the microphone and speaker. She's effectively a spying bug. So your child about, is merrily sat yeah. there in the, in the house. Right? And that's about, what, it's about 20, 30 meter distance for the Bluetooth yeah. range. So that's yeah, you get more than that on a clear line of sight. But yeah, you're talking yeah. next door flat, next yeah. door neighbor's house, street the outside. Street, so, as well, yeah. street outside, yeah. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's quite, I mean, for most people, I mean, that's, that's a good distance away from your house when you think yeah. about it, you know, that people can connect. Yeah. Who, well, who's the last person you want hearing what you're saying about them? Your neighbors, right? <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> so this is great fun. And actually we reported her, um, uh, we, we tried to tell, tell the manufacturer about the problems they've made. We were nice about it, but they just ignored us. They weren't interested. They didn't have, they didn't have any understanding of cybersecurity. They didn't have any money for cybersecurity. So in the end, reluctantly, we took it to the, um, a journalist at the BBC uh, who was very interested in it and then finally managed to get them to respond. Um, and in the end, um, the dolly was taken off the market. The company seems to have disappeared, which is a real shame because I thought the concept, you know, interactive talking kids' doll, was a nice idea. And it didn't take much to do it securely, but they didn't, which is a real shame. Uh, that's but it, the thing is, uh, it, yeah. even when, when you go to market fast, uh, to, to your point, is that well, you don't really think about how to update it later. And I think that's where yeah. many organizations struggle with is that, you know, how, how do you apply those security updates uh, to a device that only yeah. communicates through Bluetooth as well? Yeah. Um, and so, so, I mean, if they were to do this, they'd probably have to, you know, do basically, you know, a recall in some, some instances because you would actually have the update, you know, the actually uh, the embedded system itself. Um, and that's one of the big things I've seen over the years, especially for organizations who were really quick to enter the market, is they didn't really think about how is that ongoing long-term maintenance? How do I keep it updated? Even I saw, you know, light bulbs, uh, you know, having to have firmware updates. And how do you yeah. update that light bulb? You have to unscrew it, plug it into your laptop, splice the firmware, put it back in again. And that's yeah. really kind of a lot of those steps along the way. Organizations were going fast, but not really thinking about how do I maintain this? Like legacy devices, you sell it and you forget about it. But these are devices which you can't sell and forget about. You actually have to think about the long-term side of things. What's the sustainability? Yeah. Uh, and that's yeah. your point. I think, you know, that's why a lot of the organi these companies struggled in the early days. Yeah, they, they rushed. Um, you know, to, to, to do a firmware update on this dolly, it, there just wasn't any mechanism to update her. So there was no way to fix the Bluetooth bug. Um, mm -hmm. Amusingly, we, we actually went a bit further. We actually went into the mobile app and um, reverse engineered how she operated and discovered that, um, well, she had this lovely feature that if the child swore at the dolly, it would tell them to go and speak to their parents, which was kind of nice. But there was a logic flow there. We're thinking, hang on a minute. If she knows that's a swear word, she must know a swear word. So we unpacked them with the, the mobile app, discovered a SQL-like database, and then discovered all the swear words that she was looking for. Got, a, got a, over 1,500 of them, really good swear words as well. So we just deleted them, recompiled her, and now she swears like a docker. <laughs> But it's, back to your point, though, is, is the manufacturer rushed to get the product to market and hadn't thought about dealing with any sort of update or for even functionality updates in the future. Yeah. So, yeah, they kind of, that all kind of came crashing down. She got banned in Germany. Uh, then a bunch of European um, countries also mm -hmm. banned her for privacy violations. Uh, yeah, and it's just still going on. She was cited as um, the catalyst behind a, an IoT cybersecurity law in California in 2020 that's the reason why so it's kind of nice you know sort of companies got it wrong regulators realized you know regulation is often you know, a bit behind in terms of time but yep. she's inspired change which was great that's always fantastic it's just, you know, <laughs> these examples really show you know yeah. you know what organizations do do make the mistakes that we can learn from them and i think that's really important is that we actually have to make sure that we're learning from all these different types of of lessons yeah. um, especially you know when i talked about the the light bulbs they came out with the, the bridge the, the kind of the hub yeah. which allows you to connect to them. And that was the way to then maintain and update firmware uh, and also reduce, you know, uh, unwanted light bulbs from connecting to your network as well, and because that also becomes a problem. Um, so they, they do they do learn from those, um, but it has been a long journey. It, it, it feels it's been, you know, a slow moving, but of course with embedded systems, you know, it does take time to to improve them, to update them, to, to make revisions. 
Um, and what's some, what's some of the differences? What, what other types of devices have you seen that uh, has, has, has has surprised you? What's what's the shocking one? The one that one that really irritated me actually was was actually this one. It's a Fisher Price device, so it's a big brand, so Mattel, right? Yeah. And this product, it's. Do you remember these chatterbox phone used to have? Bring as it has a kid. It's made of wood. Well, they've now made them smart, so you can buy them. It's a bit of a gimmick. I, they sold extremely well last year, but what irritated me is they had fundamentally the same security vulnerability as Kayla had six, seven years before. Seven um, years ago, that's uh, it's so. 15, we, 20, 20. Yeah, we we talk about organizations learning, and and many have together. You know, if you look at Google Nest Hive, mm-hmm. they, they've really learned. They've really progressed their cybersecurity. But what really irritated me is that someone with the scale and funding of Fisher Price Mattel made the same mistake as my friend Kayla and then didn't respond well when we reported it to them. So you know, she's fundamentally, this is just the same bug. It's just a different format. But anyway, that's another story. But So things do progress. Um, and a, a, another crazy example, you might remember Joe, that, um, my, my smart kettle. So I, yes, I do remember your yeah. smart kettle. Yes, I'm a Brit, <laughs> so I like my cup of tea in the morning, of course. So you've got to have a kettle Absolutely. to boil your water. This was a fun one. Um, it's actually a Wi-Fi connected kettle. Now, all the smarts aren't in here. They're actually in the basement. Mm-hmm. There's a Wi-Fi module that connects to your your home Wi-Fi network, but uh, there were a bunch of vulnerabilities um, that meant you could do a de-authentication attack. You could then connect to the access point in here and you could recover the customer's Uh, Wi-Fi key. So the Mm -hmm. Wi-Fi key that gets you onto your home network. Now, that's less of a problem now on a home network because much more of the traffic is encrypted by default. Mm -hmm. But when this first came to market, most home Wi-Fi network traffic would be in the clear, plain text. So having someone's Wi-Fi key stolen from their smart kettle and again, similar problems, Kayla. They couldn't update it remotely. But we talked about learning and improving. Actually, the manufacturer behind this company called Smarter, um, this was their version one. They did a version two, which was a bit better. They still had problems. But their version three, actually, they, they worked with a, um, a specialist cybersecurity platform. Mm-hmm. And um, actually, the latest version, the 3.0 version of this, it's actually a really good way of boiling your water remotely and securely. So things do progress, it's, which is good. It's, it's great to hear the progression of that. Because yeah. one of the things is, um, you know, it, when we talked about, about the updating side of things, sometimes there wasn't even an external port in many of these devices to plug into. Um, and that also creates, you know, how, how do you actually connect and, 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 and modify it and, and update it um, without actually having it take, dismantle it and take it apart? Yeah. Um, and it's great. I mean, there's, there is some things, you, of course, you know, you want to, you know, boil your kettle on a timer or you want to do it remotely. You know, there, there's, there's great things about making our lives much better. Um, what's what's the concern? I mean, there's a big difference in, in here between the consumer side of things, where of course it seems to be it's all about you know getting access to somebody's home network, maybe their data, maybe their devices. So very much a big privacy issue there. Uh, so what's the difference between the risk from a consumer perspective, you know, with these devices in the home versus and a company who might even you know I, I can see a company even having the kettle in in their office as well. So. Um, it's, that's interesting, actually. So we're starting to see a lot of movements towards um, connected buildings because you know, everyone's being pushed, and rightly so, towards being more environmentally um, sustainable. You know, our buildings and offices are big consumers of uh, resources. So mm-hmm. to have a connected building that intelligently works out if it's going to be warm during the day, make sure that the windows are closed if the air conditioning's on, make sure you're not heating it up too much in the morning. That's a great idea. It saves a huge amount of money and reduces carbon dioxide emissions. So things like connected thermostats you'll see in offices, um, things like um, yeah, elevator controllers to make them more efficient, things like HVAC controllers so we're not wasting energy heating or cooling our buildings. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're seeing very, very similar security flaws in those. Um, I've actually brought one along. This is a, a smart thermostat. Um, it's actually both commercial and and residential type use. Um, mm-hmm. And we found vulnerabilities in this before we even bought it. So one of the great things about smart devices is they have to have radio frequency accreditation to the FCC or CE in the, in the EU, which mm-hmm. means that as part of their accreditation process, you can pull the circuit diagrams, all the PCB photographs for free from the, the FCC or, or CE website, which is great because it means you can start finding, the, the like you said, the various input and output ports, which might get the firmware off the chips for you. And yeah, this one was quite good fun, actually. Yeah. You might, um, might find some like UART ports in there. Or yeah, JTAG absolutely right. So actually, you can probably just see there, there's actually a JTAG connection there. So yeah, we spark the actual yeah. way in um, mm-hmm. before we'd even bought the device. So that, that's quite fun. And this, yeah. this we bought, um, and we did a talk at DEF CON, I think in 2017. We'd seen an episode of Mr. Robot. 
Uh, and also some um, some wags on Twitter suggesting as, that ransomware was happening and, oh, my thermostat's been ransomed. But actually, it was just someone joking. We thought, hang on, that's a challenge. So my colleague, Andrew Tierney, or Cyber Gibbons, worth a follow on Twitter if you want to laugh. Know, know. Cyber um, is great. <laughs> he... I challenged him to write the first ever ransomware for an embedded system. And do you know what? He did it in three days. He successfully took control of an embedded device. So this isn't ransomware on Windows, right? You know, that's, yeah. that's off the shelf, right? This is ransomware running on an embedded system, which is a completely different challenge. And we did that as a proof of concept, presented it at DEF CON in 17. And um, yeah, I, I think it really got organizations thinking, well, you know, it's, it's one thing losing access to, but losing control of my office and now someone i don't know unlocking all my doors or setting my fire alarms off or setting the sprinklers off that's a very different um, ballpark in an office losing was control the case, of your office yeah. yeah there was the case a few years ago in the hotel i can't remember what was in yeah. austria or something like that where yeah. they had a ransomware case and they couldn't actually because the 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 doors in the hotels were actually from the keys that the ransom are actually disabled and they could not open or unlock any of the doors. Yeah. Um, so that was it. That's just, I mean, to your point, it's a scary you know, a thought when you get into that is that yeah. when you think about this is controlling your access uh, to, to, to the, even the service and one, you no longer could control that. Well, there's one thing about, you know, the service being unavailable, but actually when somebody else is making the decisions over what happens with those, that's quite a scary feat. I mean, what, what would could somebody you know would somebody be able to disable for example in the kettle the the safety features um that for example you know mm. would, would certain temperatures and stuff like that you know uh, hvac because i know even if you're doing hvac in a data center um sometimes uh the data center machines you know the servers are usually set to uh start shutting down at 36 degrees you know uh, or 40 degrees to to prevent uh you know overheating and the, and the hard disks from failing um what if you're able to turn up that that thermostat to, to, to increase the temperature. You I'll tell you a story, actually, um, an embarrassing <laughs> one as well. Um, so actually, the firm of accountants we were using at the time invited mm -hmm. us in and said, look, we've got a really early building management system. And we thought, oh, let's have a look at that. And we started looking at it. And it, it, it just fell over the minute we started looking at it, at which point all the fans went off in the server rooms. And all of a sudden, <laughs> there's lots of messages from the servers going, I'm getting really hot. <laughs> I'm getting really hot. And we're like, OK, all right. I, think, I think we need to step away. And we just reset it and everything came back on. But um, it, it, it makes you realize that IT infrastructures of organizations rely incredibly so on, on uh, air cooling to keep the servers happy. Yep. Wow. I heard I heard them. You know, the, that's one thing is that, you know, we talk about these air gap systems, we talk about these separations and segmented networks. And, um, but really, when you think about it, in many cases, there is some type of sensor or data that's been transferred between one of the one of the other. Um, and you get into really thinking about that, you know, it is the IT side of things where, it, of course, is very, very connected and very, you know, available. And OT tends to be not so common. But it's, of course, those connectivities are increasing over and over again. Uh, to the point where it is really IT that's not protecting the OT environment. And I even remember cases where even you've done a lot in the aviation side. Uh, I remember there was a lot of cases where, well, the flight control is separated from you know the entertainment network. But on the entertainment network, um, I believe it was the uh, uh, the oxygen mask um, and the cabin pressure controls were on. So if you actually were able to you know fake deploy the oxygen masks it would actually force the plane to start descending because of assumed cabin pressure failure. So all yeah, of those things didn't yeah. get connected. Um, so what, have you any experience? What, what's your what's your fun stories from the aviation side? Because <laughs> we had, I really enjoy, you You do every year uh, the aviation village and also yeah. you do they set up the, the uh, flight simulation side of things, which is always right. fun. Um, but any interesting uh, experience from that side of things? Yeah, so... <laughs> It's insanely difficult to hack an airplane. And the reason for that is, is there is a, we talk about physical separation. The, the flight control mm -hmm. systems are what's called the aircraft control domain, as in, you know, the yokes yeah. and the engine controls. They're all completely separate. So they sit on a separate domain. Um, you know, they're behind physical security, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, it's incredibly difficult to compromise those systems. So you have, mm -hmm. um, you'll have to compromise typically two to three networks concurrently with millisecond timing. And there have been some stories in the press about hacking airplanes. They don't really line up with, with reality. However, of course, you know, there, there is always a, a however. And that is that airplanes are getting increasingly connected, but it's more yeah. the information systems that go to the pilot. So when a pilot goes to take off, they don't really use full power. They don't use full thrust because mm -hmm. it uses a lot of 
fuel and where's the engine so if you've got a nice long runway and a nice headwind you use half power for example if you're not particularly well loaded mm -hmm. But the calculators that work that out for you are typically done on a tablet computer. And we found all sorts of problems with some of the apps, some of the tablets, some of the configurations, some of the lack of lockdown that meant you could feed the wrong information to the pilot so they didn't put enough power on. And what usually happens is you, you have a tail strike where you drag the backside out of the plane and causes millions of pounds worth of damage. So you can't hack planes. But you sort of can in sort of convoluted ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it's definitely, it's great to know that uh, they do have, you know, when they when they think about those safety, a lot of the safety systems yeah. was, of course, the main the main focus of that is to to isolate them, main make sure there's multiple systems that's actually providing the data and uh, the controls. Uh, so yes. it makes it very very difficult. And they, they um, do go wrong. They do go wrong from time to time. They, very they, very rarely. Um, yeah. <laughs> but they do go wrong. And but what, what's fascinating about that is it's so rare that those sort of stories make the press which is yep. in, insanely do. rare, but also fascinating. That, And it's, I think this is something we can all take from this. Is the one thing I love about aviation, I'm a pilot, by the way, not a very good one, but I am a pilot, um, is that well, whenever you, there's... You did, help, you did help me land the A320. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say you're, you're, you're a very good pilot. <laughs> practice, practice. What, is, what I love, and I think we could all learn from this in, in general cyber as well, is in the aviation industry, if anything goes wrong, everyone shares. Everyone talks yep. about it, and we will learn from it without attributing blame. And that is such a powerful thing that I think we could all take away on, on the ground, is that the, the more we share, share carefully, redact and anonymize, but the more we share about you know, um, attacker activity, the more likely we are to be able to help others defend. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing I love about aviation. There's a plane crash or even a minor incident. We talk about it. We write it up. It's investigated. Blame's not attributed. If more training's required, it's given. Mm -hmm. We could take a lot from that on the ground. I, I completely agree because I mean, in the industry, I mean, there's a very segmented part of the industry where that one half seems to be, you know, jumping to the to the, you know, helping. Uh, another half of the industry tends to be pointing fingers of blame, um, telling you know we did you so. And I would like it to to I'd like that to to change. I would like to see us all come together and, and to that point, you know, mm -hmm. sharing responsible uh, with responsibility. Uh, making sure the information is there and not pointing blame because you know a lot of cases we don't know the the fine details um and you're only finding out what's publicly available but it which isn't all the information that's happening um yeah. i so think there's a lot that we I, yeah there's, yeah, there's, there's yeah. some really interesting communities in the usa as well actually so the, that was yeah. called the ISACs or the information sharing analysis centers mm -hmm. set up during i think the bush administration the mm -hmm. first one i think um and they're actually partly partly gov funded, and they they encourage industry and enable industry to share intel mm -hmm. in a in a in a safe way. So effectively, you've got competitors sharing cyber intel with each other. That's wonderful, and I think I think there's a lot fantastic. we can take because from that in Europe good. too. I agree. So yeah. given that you know, given the, the government side of things, I know that there's been a lot of regulation regulation discussion. I know in the EU there was the IoT kind of discussion. I know in the U UK they talked about you know getting rid of default credentials and passwords and all of that side of things and, and different regulations. And there's also uh, laws in the US that's kind of looking into a lot of these changes as well. What do you think, you know, will, will regulation and government kind of oversight and, and you know, uh, policies and compliance, will it make a difference? Will it change how we do things? So I've never been a huge fan of regulation per se, because it's, it's always too little, too late, right? Um, mm -hmm. But actually, because I think IoT is a bit different, because it's um, you're asking the consumer to make an informed decision about purchasing a product based on cybersecurity that they understand. And actually, that's, I think, where regulation can and, and will help in, in, in this particular space. Um, regulation took a, took a long while to come to into effect. Um, so one mm -hmm. of the first we had was the uh, Cybersecurity of IoT Act in the US a couple of years back. But that only affected federal agencies. So it basically said that if, if a federal agency was buying something, it had to be secure if it was smart. Um, I'm not sure that had quite the effect that everyone hoped it would. Mm -hmm. uh, in the UK, we had um, Department for Culture, Media and Sport um, went and consulted and came up with uh, some clauses in the Product Security Telecommunications Infrastructure Bill, which is a mouthful. Um, and that's just come onto the statute, which is lovely. But like you say, it talks about default passwords. But most importantly, it talks about length of support for a product. And I think that's a really important uh, point for a consumer. Yes. So that how long are you going to support my product for? How long am I going to get security updates for? How long is it going to last? Because um, there are all sorts of products. I mean, you know, Kayla doesn't work anymore. Actually, I've got on the, I've got some, uh, what is it? The... Uh, one of the connected teddy bears up there that was just end of life 
when the manufacturer went bust. So now you've just got an expensive teddy bear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but that's that's a great point. Is because years ago, you know, when when I've been in this industry for a long time, like yourself, is that you expected, you know. Uh, devices to be along, you know, around for quite a long time. They had usually had a five plus year life cycle, um, and they were independent of anything else. Um, you know, you'd have games consoles, telephones, laptops, computers that all had this long. And even in the industrial side of things, um, you know, we, we've we've seen devices in the maritime which has been around for twenty plus years. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, even when you start seeing you know the Windows ninety five logo, you start going, well, okay, <laughs> what can you do? Um, so, so some devices are around for quite a long time, but I think it's really important to your point is that, you know, what's the life cycle? What's, what's the life expectancy of those? And that can also allow you to make those more informed decisions about if you're, mm-hmm. if you were planning something for longer, you might just decide to go to another vendor, uh, to get what you really need. So that make sure that one is you're getting the updates and, and the post, uh, security and privacy and all of those things. And to your point there, there's a really interesting, um, a press discussion. I think Sonos, the connected speaker manufacturer, they, so remember they that, yeah. do you remember they openly said that they were going to end of life product with, I think they gave three years notice or something and the world lost his shit. It was, it was incredible, yeah. but actually kudos to them because they were honest and open about it. So many other vendors have just gone, oh, it's gone, right? It's been deprecated. We've got 2.0 now. And I, I think it's, it's really important that people are open and honest that we are going to accept the cost of supporting and updating this product for the next three years. That's how long it's going to be. Okay, I'm now informed. Um, unlike, I think uh, Google acquired a firm called Resolve, or Revolve, I think it was. They bought a hub and the end of life did it almost immediately. And in the end, the um, uh, I think Consumer Reports in the US made a complaint and then... Um, a U.S. agency actually enforced and um, forced Google to compensate customers. So yeah, yeah, that's it, it's, it's it's a great to be informed about. You know, what is the life of this? You know, because because a lot of times you're you're paying, you know, you're paying for the hardware and you're paying for the software, and then all of a sudden you find that it becomes useless. And it also gets into the sustainability side of things as well, because you know we're yeah. we're creating a lot of technology waste. Yeah. Um, as a result of this, and, and you know, if, if it can't be reused, or what's what's the recycling capability after you do that end of life? Are you actually taking them the devices back and and repurposing and reusing them? Um, so you also get into the whole green and sustainability side of discussion, which is yeah. also a massive area, especially around IoT devices. Because we are the so worst offender there. I might add, we we are the worst <laughs> offender of anybody I know because of course we in order to do this resets, we have to buy loads and loads of IoT gear. And most of it gets taken apart. And during that process, it'll often get you know, damaged beyond repair as, we, as we're trying to extract memory and firmware and things. So we had <laughs> we had several dumpsters of IoT waste that we had to send off to get e-recycled e- e- in the last week alone. It was enormous. But yeah, so don't take us as a good example. But, but, still, but still, it's 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 part of that, that research side of things that's really yeah. identifying this in the long term, which can actually, yeah. you know, ultimately make make things better. Where do you see the future of this going? What what do you see, you know, in, in, in connected devices and uh, vulnerability disclosure and you know getting into regulation. Yeah. Where do you see the future going? What what's the direction you've seen organisations in this space taking? So an interesting thing happened a couple of weeks back. So the Biden administration, I think, was an ex- executive order around um, smart product cyber labelling in the US, which I think was a huge step forward. Uh, my only concern about it is is how do you correctly or usefully label a product to convey its degree of cybersecurity? How do you assess it? How do you communicate in a way that you know the average Joe can walk into Best Buy or Target and go, yeah, oh, that's yeah, I'll buy that one because it's got an A A B B C F rating, that's, or it's green. I don't know. And um, yeah, we we've battled with the concept of of consumer labeling for a long time you know, trying to think of a way that you you easily convey that it's okay yeah. and it's not easy and I, I wish I, I wish the team that's doing it I believe um, part of the team behind NIST is heavily involved too I wish them the best of luck solving that thorny that's, problem that's, I mean we struggle with that in security in general about risk yeah. assessment <laughs> and yeah. that's something you know um, we have lots of different labels and acronyms for all of that yeah. um, but I guess I mean, the problem is, is that I guess it really comes down to the, you know um, if the price difference is so big though mm. is that you know do you really think consumers are really gonna you know if if they have that choice between uh, price point are they really gonna choose the more privacy secure uh, longer lasting device I think the long I think that sustainability piece that how long will this you know be supported for 
I think that might be a bigger impact than maybe yeah. the security and the privacy portion. Um, I, you know, is this, I'd like is this going to be yeah. a five year thing or is it going to be like a six month thing? I, I wish I hadn't. We've just thrown away two identical CCTV cameras. The, the form factor was identical. One was half the price of the other. One's hackable, one wasn't. How, how do you as a consumer do that? And that's why I, I like the idea of some regulation. It's actually to slightly increase the barriers to entry to a certain market to, so that the manufacturers that genuinely take cybersecurity seriously and, and really take their responsibilities with our data properly mm -hmm. aren't undermined and undercut by XYZ product that is, you know, mm -hmm. does the same things, but really, really badly and will be unsupported after six months. I think that I think those you know that unsupported side of things I think it might be the big driver. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's where people might make the decision because if I have to buy it every six months, that's going to be the, the a driver to the cost. If I can buy this and it's going to last for five years, it's more attractable from you know you you will pay more for that uh, as well. You know, getting that security side of things as well. Uh, but you're absolutely right. You you need some visibility. You know, whether it's got yeah. privacy in there, whether it's got you know sustainable from a security perspective perspective. If I'm going to plug this in, I think that's really where regulation, not only about the labeling side of things, but also about making sure that these devices have a baseline of security built into them as well, that they've got you know, a minimum amount of standard and best practices. Those are really yeah. where organizations and, and, and you know, for people buying those devices will at least have, you know, we don't want the world to become cybersecurity experts because that's not going to happen. Um, but we want to make sure that whatever they're buying has went through a really good set of basic security practices so that they don't need to. It's something that they can just buy with confidence that if it's on the shelf, that uh, that's already been through a certain level of you know uh, certification and, and checking and validation. Uh, that can make a big difference, I think. Hell yeah. It, I, mean, I think you're asking also about vulnerability disclosure as well. That, that's been really challenging for us is... Every time we find a bug, we, we do what we believe is the right thing is we, we, we try to get hold of the manufacturer and tell them nicely and give them some tips about how to fix it and mm -hmm. give them a timeline. So, look, just 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 talk to us. We'll give you some guidance. It's not going to cost anything. You know, we'll point you at some third parties who can help you. But most of the time we get stonewalled. And really? I mean, because yeah. we've had we, we've had discussion. We had Casey Ellis on a few times talking about, you know, this vulnerability disclosure. Yeah. We had Katie Mazuris and stuff. And that was always yeah. fun. Um, and from the software perspective, I think they are making a lot of you know inroads and a lot of improvements there. Definitely, you know, even Google's uh, uh, Zero Project and the vulnerability disclosure. I think that seems to be, you know, it seems to be working. And of course, we'd like to see it across more broadened perspective. But with IoT devices, I, I guess your point is that it's not quite there yet. Um, and and I, we still have challenges, yeah. even in general vulnerability disclosure. So. I know Casey and um, Katie very very well to chat to. We usually end up bumping each other like you at, uh, at, at DEF CON each year. Um, one of the areas that I, I think even within Bug Bounty that really struggles with is the motivation for researchers isn't always money. And whilst I think it's fantastic that Bug Bounty is in place, I think that's a wonderful mm -hmm. thing to be able to reward researchers. There's a gap to our mind, and that is not everyone is out there for the cash. Some okay, people are out there because... Yeah. And a lot of organizations don't have a way to receive a vulnerability report that doesn't involve mm -hmm. non-disclosure and, and no cash. And that's actually caused us a lot of problems over the years um, with vendors saying, well, yeah, if we're going to give you money, then you know, we're buying you silence. I'm saying, well, that's not why we're doing this. We're doing it because we'd like to see you improve it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, I mean, I think I find as, as well as that a lot of people, the researchers who do this, um, many of them do it because it's their passion. It's it's what they enjoy doing. Is is they have a motivation not for the money side, but to make the world a safer place. Yeah. And they want to make sure that you know they're adding value to the industry and they're using their skills for good. And there's many out there that's doing this. And and sometimes they are you know running a fine line between the legal side of things because when you look at a lot of these devices, the EULAs and the the you know software bill of materials, all of those things really is telling you you're not allowed to find these these, these flaws <laughs> and that becomes very complicated and uh, i think you know in some cases where those organizations who don't have vulnerability disclosure processes or have bug bounty programs um i think you know it really makes it difficult for researchers to do it properly yeah, it can be really enabling actually so when when yeah. a bug bounty is in place and actually they have a defined terms of terms of reference that can be really helpful to enabling research giving the researchers safe harbor so they can do the right things and exactly. and, 
and explore. And it's, it's, it works for everybody. It's just there is a bit of a gap, um, particularly when you're working around IoT, particularly when you're working with, with slightly different motivations, maybe slightly more altruistic motivations. It can, can cause... Uh, yeah, frustration sometimes, should we say? Yes, <laughs> I've, I've been in that place a, a, a few times. <laughs> so, um, where you, you sometimes you just you know your your head's yeah. against the table and just like oh, here we go again, and yeah. and it's just sometimes it feels a repetitive. It's just stay, it's the same yeah. process over again. Um, I even remember you know um, I did uh, it was during and this, this was in its response case that I worked on. Um, I was doing in its response. I was looking into digital forensics. And I found an organization uh, that had become a victim of the same ransomware because the, the criminals were simply just copy and pasting their scripts and they copy and pasted the previous logs of the scripts. And in those logs, it had captured all of this organization's uh, data, including the usernames, passwords, server names, IPs, the whole thing was in there. Uh, so I, I got permission to go and contact them proactively and say, hey, I'm working in this case. Um, and I find that you've become a victim as well. And they kind of responded, no, we have not. Nothing to see here. It was just the it was just the the brick wall coming up, the door closed, slam. You know, don't come back. And I went back again. I was like, maybe you haven't realized you become a victim. Maybe there is still in your network, and and this is an opportunity to 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 stop it. And door closed. That was it. And about two months and two and a half months later, when I had to basically you know close everything up, had to archive everything, do the supply chain, hand over all the files, and it went to the legal team and law enforcement. I said. I'm just going to do the right thing and let them know that I'm passing on the data that includes information <laughs> that I had. Um, and I said, Hey, you know, just let you know that I've passed on the files, which looks like, you know, you're a victim to law enforcement and the legal team of the company. And immediately right afterwards, they responded. Once they knew that I was passing it over to another agency of law enforcement, they responded and said, yep, we were a victim. We, we tried to clean it up. We hit it. Uh, we didn't want the, the and that's when you start realizing that a lot of these cases, you know, especially when even in vulnerability disclosure, it's very similar, even though it's more about the actually disclosure of incidents, is that most want to stay, you know, they don't want the PR. They don't want the public uh, backlash. Um, because, again, to your point, the difference between our industry and the airline industry is that a lot of victimization, blaming, and, and that has a lot of negativity. I think that's if we want people to disclose you know, let's say, without fear, even anonymizing it, we have to make sure that we we address the victim blaming side of things um, as much as we can and work together and, and do that. Yeah. You know, the, a, the there's a really interesting data. thing, there's a, a flavor we've had on that with, with disclosure around, particularly around IoT, is someone's put their blood, sweat and tears and finances into building something and they've got it to market and then some sodding security researcher comes to them and goes oh, mm, it's a problem and it's it's like being told there's a fault with your baby yep. and that can be very very hard for someone to hear a anybody would struggle to receive the fact that their their project their love their everything they've done for the last years has got problems and i think it's it's being sensitive to that is is really really important it can be very easy for a security researcher to come in gung-ho and go ah you got a problem we're going to tell the world about it if you don't behave <laughs> and actually what the first natural human response is probably aggression. So yeah, think, one needs to be really yeah, care, take real care with the way one does it. Yeah, you you bring up a really important point, and this is probably you know where we can do some training around this type yeah. of thing is how to disclose with responsibility. But it's not like pointing fingers, but it's yeah. like let's let's help make your baby better <laughs> together. Yeah. Let's let's help help you know address the you know. Uh, the issues, and, and you know, I think there's, there's a way of dealing with that, and I don't think you know. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I've seen, I've seen some of the ways. I even just saw uh, somebody doing a bug bounty uh, for another organization recently. I saw the message that there is a way of doing it with, you know, that's ethically with, uh, with you know, what's what's the right word with, you know, uh, I'm trying to think about it with empathy, you know, mm -hmm. that, you know, we're, we're not pointing fingers and saying, you know, <laughs> you did a bad job. What we're saying is you did a great job, but let's make it safer. <laughs> let's, let's, it, let's, let's make it better. A new term, empathetic disclosure as opposed to ethical disclosure. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> it's a, it's a good, good, good choice for a, a future talk. <laughs> so it's, so, but Ken, it's, as always, it's been fantastic having you on. And really, uh, you know, your, your knowledge and insightful and what you do to the industry is definitely making the world a safer place. And, um, you know, and, and definitely I'm always excited about uh, some of the future uh, revelations and uh, 
uh, details you'll be sharing. So and I'll be looking forward to catching up with you at DEF CON this year. And uh, we should definitely grab uh, a drink together. But it's been Bring fantastic it having you on the show. Any final words of wisdom for the audience that you'd, uh, is there any resources that you'd recommend people to go to uh, that can help um, them find more information about this? Well, OK, if you're looking for advice around IoTs, we wrote some development guides a little while back, just the, the questions to ask early on. Uh, more than anything, in fact, for anything to do with cyber, but particularly IoT, is get a bit of guidance on day one. It's mm -hmm. so much cheaper and faster to build cybersecurity in at the beginning, like the right choice of microcontrollers, the right choice of storage memory, the right, the right PCB manufacturer. It's so much cheaper to build cybersecurity in at the beginning than it is to try and retrofit it in after you've already been to the fab and had your PCBs designed. So start early, it's, it's cheaper. I completely agree. You know, ch Changing the Bluetooth module much later yeah. is, is a very costly thing to do. And that really gets the point is that we have this whole shift left concept and we have uh, security by design. And ultimately, I believe that you know the next step after that is getting to security security by default, is that that becomes the ultimate you know the ultimate desire you know uh, goal is to make sure that it's not only by design but people can actually use it easily as well. And that's an important factor. Ken, it's always it's fantastic to have you on. I always really enjoy talking to you. I'm looking forward to to flying the the next uh, simulation as well. At some point, I did miss InfoSec this year, so unfortunately, I wasn't there. But well, uh, we'll be there be in the aerospace village at DEFCON this year. So you know, if anyone's listening, we'll come along you. for a little fly. Do come along; be great fun. Good to, and good to see you there too. So for everyone, you know, tune in every two weeks for the Forum Access and I podcast. I hope this has been very educational, very insightful into you know all the things smart, um, connected, uh, IoT, embedded systems, and really giving a bit of insight into that world because definitely it's something that's going to impact our lives on a daily basis. It's going to make our lives better, but we also want to make sure that it stays, you know, that it's safe, that it's secure, that it's private. And that we have knowledge and we have the visibility to make the right decisions. So, Ken, it's been awesome having you on and look forward to catching up soon. For the audience, see you again. Take care and stay safe. Thank you.